Policy at the Society and College of Radiographers. It's a pleasure to be here this evening and thank you to Foddy for inviting me to chair. Um, we've got a fantastic evening ahead. It's the fourth event, I think, isn't it, Foddy, that you've organised? And Foddy, fourth in London even, and such a good turnout. My colleague from Wales is absolutely amazed how many uh, radiographers are here. So well done to all of you. Great CPD and I hope there's going to be some great discussion, great opportunity for networking. Um, I haven't had any instructions about fire exits, but they are at the back there, so I think if we hear a bell, then we head out that way and for your directors. Just to say that we're going to save questions until after each of the speakers have, have spoken and have a really good discussion at the end. Uh, we are hoping to live um, film this for um, Periscope, and we welcome questions by Twitter and Facebook. So Foddy's agreed to talk for one minute of my time. So Foddy, you've got one minute. <laughs> Hello everyone. It's a bit high actually, isn't it? Um, good evening everyone and welcome and uh, a big thank you to, uh, to Charlotte there. I just want to say this is um, an interesting one for us because this is, we've previously done events that's been centred around reporting but we felt it was time to, to open up the, uh, this, this, the discussion and bring it around diagnostic and therapy. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, I just want to say a few words very quickly. We have um, run this event for the everyone that we've done, so this is the sixth one, so we've done two in Manchester as well. So um, uh, we, we've run in partnership with the Society and College of Radiographers and British Institute of Radiology, and I feel that collaboration works really, really well, and we can't thank enough the uh, support and the uh, relationship we've got with, uh, with yourselves and, and with the BIR as well. Um, I think you know um, Charlotte now is just introduced, we're going to have Sue up in a minute, and Kevin from the Society, we've got Sarah and Carol from the BIR, do you want to raise your hands? <laughs> So any uh, conversations you want to have afterwards about anything, membership or any discussions, please do. We've got some really good people of all, of all sort of walks here today, actually, which is quite interesting. Uh, I really hope you enjoy it. We have got a couple of things uh, more to say. One of the things I want to be able to really say is the two messages that I want uh, people to think about today. One is around professional accountability. So one of the overarching things you're going to find with all the presentations uh, tonight is there's this going to be this sense of how much we've got to take accountability for our profession but also take in the support of everyone else that's coming through uh, like the um, NHS bodies like NHS England, NHS Improvement, Health Education England. The support's out there but we've got to take ownership ourselves. The second message and this is the overarching message I'd say every time I do this event is I want everyone to think about what they're going to do when they leave the room, um, maybe that's going to be sleeping. So not that straight away, but after the sleeping, uh, what they're going to do tomorrow as a result of what they've learned today. Uh, because these events, brilliant, it's great to put them on, but really what I want everyone thinking about is uh, what can we do as a result of what we hear and learn tonight. That's just over a minute, <laughs> but I'm just going to do a quick introduction to, uh, before we carry on, I want to introduce you to Apollo Esconde. I hope I've said your surname right, Apollo. Apollo's an MRI radiographer for InHealth, uh, works at Croydon. He's working on quite an interesting uh, project at the moment, which he's going to tell you about. Um, and we've got the uh, slides ready for you, Apollo, so uh, uh, if you'd like to welcome up, Apollo. But thank you very much. Have a lovely evening. Hi, um, thank you very much for the, for the introduction and the opportunity. Good evening, everyone. My name is Apollo Esconde. I'm one of the MRI senior radiographers in Croydon um, in Health, Croydon University Hospital. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, thank you. So dealing with the scan shoes, claustrophobic kids, plus size patients, and them not having get through their scans makes me sad like very. So some of my patients will say, Apollo, I can't do this, bring me out, take me out. I was not informed, which always leave my heart crushed and emotionally disturbed. It was from these very statements I started asking myself, what can I do to help them? I perceive that if I create something, add or change, that may allay their worries. I was mentally challenged. If a patient was referred for an open MRI, it was because they did not manage to do it in a conventional MRI. And if they fail to do this again, it will further delay their treatment. I realized that it was not claustrophobia or anxiety that stops them from having the scan, 
but the lack of support system. Over the years, I have learned not only how to assess their scans, but how to assess their level of fear. From every echo of protest, it inspired me to create a solution to help my patients conquer it that would aid alongside the holistic approach. And thus, the LEGO Open MRI was born. The LEGO Open MRI idea was designed to show at the earliest possible stage, like wards, clinics, and doctor's offices, so um, to show them how the MRI process works to eliminate any uh, misconceptions or worries that they may have. I am trying to reach as many as I can by sharing my link, my posts, and hashtags. It gets spread sporadically, raising awareness about claustrophobia and anxiety. To cast your support, you just type in any search engine, Lego Open MRI, register, activate your account, click support until it says supporting, and a number will be given to you at the end. For every cast of support that um, you give, it gets us closer to the 10,000 goal, building confidence one Lego break at a time. So ladies and gentlemen, I stand here in front of you not as one, but together with the 5-7% to claustrophobic population of the world. I hope that you will help me to help those who cannot. Thank you. Thank you, Apollo, and a very clear message to all of us. That's the one action we must all do straight away, and it's been great to see um, the work that's been done on, on the LINAC um, and our LINAC unit, which is now for sale, so it can be done. So I'd next like to introduce, I think I'll leave this slide up, Sue, if it's all right. I'd like to introduce, introduce our president, Sue Webb, who works in Broomfield. Sue's the president of the Society and College of Radiographers, inaugurated um, last year and serves until July this year. Thank you, Sue. Steep steps. We'll have to come I think I'll just hide. <laughs> Good evening and hello everyone. My name is Sue and I'm a radiographer, as Charlotte said. And this year I also have the privilege of being the president of the Society and College of Radiographers. I'd like to thank InHealth for arranging this evening here at St Thomas's. We're going to hear from some very clever people about how they see the future of the profession and how they see it moving forwards. Technology is moving on at a great pace and radiographers have always been quick to adapt to and use new modalities and push the boundaries into wider fields. We must carry on adapting and not be overwhelmed by the speed of change. I've been a radiographer for over 25 years and since I started work as a diagnostic radiographer, our way of working has moved on so quickly. When I started, we had a one slice CT scanner, no MRI, ultrasound with a few dots on the screen in a dark room, and we were delighted to have a new digital daylight processor. The end of dark rooms and fumes was coming, and the dread of fogging the hopper receding. If someone had told me then about the present speed of the scanners, digital imaging, and the way radiographers have moved into advanced practice, reporting and running their own clinics, I wouldn't have believed them. It would have sounded like the stuff of science fiction. But we have done this, and far more. Consultant radiographers, radiographers with doctorates and autonomous working are in evidence all around the UK. In my year as president, I've travelled out of the UK for RSNA in the USA and to Vienna for ECR. And there I've had the chance to talk to radiographers and rad techs from around the world. I found that the UK is looked up to as the peak of our professional standards and our practice is held in great esteem by everybody abroad. I was talking to Melissa who is the my equivalent in America and she couldn't believe that we have radiographers here that do autonomous reporting. I was saying that radiographers report and she said but surely they're double read by a radiologist and I said no. Um, she also found it quite amazing that we have radiographers running their own clinics such as in Barium clinics, we have consultant breast radiographers. It's all very far removed from their world over there, but it is something they aspire to. And as I say, around the world we are looked up to as the pinnacle of professionalism. And we need to keep that up. We're here tonight to hear about the future. And as a profession, we have to continue to advance our practice 
through research and new ideas and adapt to all the innovations which seem to be arriving at an incredible speed. Our students must be prepared for this ever-changing world and encouraged to keep up their research and motivation. Last week I met students at City University and I was very pleased with their interest in research and advanced practice. But there is one thing that we must always keep in mind, that this advancement and change must be in the best interests of our patients. They are at the heart of all we do and not, must not be forgotten in this technological world. We still need to give them the care and attention and not overlook the human factors. It's easy to forget that they're the centre of our practice and get caught up in the technology. And we must recognise the fear and emotions of all our patients. Time and kindness will always be paramount importance in dealing with them. Anyway, thank you for all coming tonight. I'm sure we're going to hear about some interesting developments that will become routine in years to come. And we'll look back and think, really? 126 slice CT scanner? How amazing. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Sue. And I think that's framed our evening really well. Everything we do as a profession must be centred around the patient and the value that we can add to that patient's care. And I think we are in a very technologically driven profession, so actually articulating and understanding what that looks like from the patient's perspective is hugely important. We're going to really look into the future, or is it the near future? And it gives me great pleasure to invite my colleague, Kevin Tucker, who's the National Officer for Wales at the Society and College of Radiographers, also a radiographer, who's going to give us an insight into his views on artificial intelligence and radiography reporting. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So, artificial intelligence, eh? Fascinating stuff. My working title was, you know, why is it, you know, what's it, why it is important for radiographers to be at the discussion table? Or is it? And that's a question. We need to explore this a little bit more this evening. So, the things we're going to cover are, you know, what is artificial intelligence? What do we mean by it? How does it work? And I'll only sort of, sort of dip your toes into it because it's, it's really quite complicated. So, I'll explain it as easily as I possibly can. Just be honest, if you move slightly that way for the people online. If I move here, I can't see that. Ah! So, we can move it right. <laughs> The challenges of speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Do I need my like right? I can't like, so, so now I can't see it without my glasses, and I can't see it with my glasses. So, um, so this should be fun. <laughs> then we'll look at AI and radiology, and then we'll ask that question: You know, are we at the table? Do we need to be at this uh, discussion table? So first thing, let's have a look at what we mean by AI. And it, it, you know, it, Russian dolls, those matric, is it matryoshka dolls? You know, one inside the other? This is what we're sort of describing when we talk about AI. Artificial intelligence is the overarching subject, but within that you've got machine learning, and you've got the most important thing for us, which is deep learning. If I was to, if I was to say, you know, in, in one sentence what AI is, it would be, that it's a system that can think. The longer explanation, of course, would be you know any machine or algorithm that can, that can study its environment, that can think independently. So the key words here are, are autonomous thinking and being made, able to make decisions and this ability to interact with other machines as well. Because I'm, I'm not sure if anybody's seen the uh, Watson machine, the IBM machine, but you know, that's able to tap into radiology, GP records, pathology, and assimilate all that data to give an output. And that's the real skill of AI. Because you know, humans, we are, we are very predictive. We're able to analyze data. We're able to tell you what that data is saying. 
For a machine to do that is really difficult. But the pace of change is such that it's uh, happening very, very quickly now. So we're all familiar with our mobile phones and all these other things that um, could be AI. Are they AI? Or are they just software? And when I think of software, you think of programming. It's just that, you know, with a program, it's if this condition is met, that happens. If it's not meant, met, met, something else happens. That's sort of a very simple description of, of programming. AI is completely different to that, of course. So if you look at the list here, which ones could you pick out and say, and say that is definitely just software or that is, that is real artificial intelligence? And it can be quite difficult, because if you think about you know, the virtual assistants, Siri, Alexa, Katana, they're, they're not really, I, I wouldn't say they're really AI at the moment. Come back in a few months, come back in a year, that the answer might be completely different. Certain things on there just are, yeah. they're definitely AI. If you think about autom autonomous cars, cars are able to, to negotiate traffic, other cars, pedestrians, without human intervention. So the, the machine is thinking for itself. And I was a government minister on uh, the radio the other day who said that they will be on the streets of Greenwich by the end of 2019. So some of you might want to keep clear of Greenwich <laughs> at the end of the year. But it's, um, it is a fascinating field that we're sort of going into. Now machine learning, of course, that's a, that's a subset of, of AI. And now we're starting to look at a lot more data. I've already mentioned Watson and the fact that it can tap into all these different information sources. So, some of these machines are able to tap into so much data, it's very difficult for a human to actually assimilate that and come, come, you know, give an output from, from that data quickly, whereas a machine can do it particularly quickly. Deep learning, the one thing that we're really interested in tonight, is again, it's a subset of machine learning. And now we start to, so they, they started to mimic the human brain. They're called neural networks. And the one thing we've got in, in, that's of a, a particular interest to us is convolutional neural networks. And I'll show you a diagram of one in a moment. Again, a very simple diagram. And again, these are able to utilize vast amounts of, you, uh, of data and very, very quickly and to give you some sort of output. And it's only possible, you know, if you think about AI has been around since the 1950s. So it's been around 60, 70 years. But the thing that's making the big difference now is processor speed, storage speed, network speed. And the field is moving incredibly fast. So here's my diagram. And again, as I said, it's very simple. So uh, if I can point it here. If I press this point, I could turn the whole thing off. I better not point that. I'll, I'll just I'll show you. Look at the screen. On the, on the left-hand side, in red, you've got the, um, the input la layer. Now, and on the right-hand side, you've got the output layer. How simple, how simple this is. In between, you've got, this is where the magic happens. This is the, the hidden layer. And the hidden layer is certainly not going to be one one set of um, algorithms deep. It is going to be a very, very complex system. And what it really does, actually, you're just passing data through a mathematical web. And the data is able to be transformed as it goes along. And each of those blue dots there has a weighting, it's got a bias, and it's able to adapt over time so that it can learn. So the pathways are created by the machine itself. I'll try to, I'll try to give you an example. If, if on the right hand, uh, left hand side, all of that data going in were normal chest x-rays. 
normal chest strain, one after another. This is normal, this is normal. And you, and you fed this machine with about half a million normal machines. The output side would be saying, yeah, I've learned this is normal, this is normal. Then you throw in an abnormal one, and it'll say, this is not normal, it's abnormal, but I don't know what it is. So, but you can train the machine to identify different pathologies. Simple reading that. It's like a, the, the blue bit is just like a black box, the magic box. And this is all to do with algorithms. Now, some of you who work in CT, remember the, 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 the windows, you alter your windows, you're just changing algorithms. That's what you're doing. So bone window, uh, lung window, you're changing the algorithm so the machine can project the data, the output data, in a different way to you. So in simple terms, it's a procedure that tells your computer precisely what steps to take to solve a problem. And you know, you, know, you may not realise, but we're governed by them now. If go on to um, go on to Amazon. Amazon will, you'll, you'll buy something, you'll buy a, you know, a deep freezer and for the next two years you're bombarded with Amazon trying to sell you another deep freezer as if you really need one. You know, it's that sort of thing. So the machine is able to identify what you're interested in. Same with Netflix. You've tried this, try this. But it's when these algorithms are chained together, they be, they're able to really go to town on the data and manipulate it incredibly well. But I've already said, so you've got to put the data in, haven't you? You've got to put the data in, because the machine's not going to learn straight away. It will learn eventually, it'll be self-learning self eventually. And if you've got time, look on, on YouTube and look up, uh, look up the game Go and how algorithms have been used to play that game, which at one time was considered completely impossible to, to convert into, a, into a, you know, to an electronic form. I'll, I'll just say that, look it up, it's fascinating. So, in Stanford University, they, they had a lot of data, they had um, a quarter of a million chest x-rays. And there were a number of pathologies on, on the chest x-rays, but most of them were, were normal. So they developed this um, algorithm called uh, Checks Next, and that was their starting point. But what, what they also did, they said, there might be some clever people out there who, who are able to analyze this data and produce better algorithms than us. And so they're running a competition. They'll allow people access to their data, and at the end of all that, they will be able to, to trial their data against everybody else's with 500 images that no one has seen. And this is, I think the point I'm trying to make here is, it's the data which is critical at the moment. The, the learning data, the data that's going to create the algorithms. Because it is a problem actually getting hold of good quality data, particularly in the UK. So AI and radiology, and and all the things I discuss here, I might talk about um, uh, an AI program that's detecting something in a chest X-ray. But it doesn't matter because these algorithms can be developed in a similar way to detect anything. But the public expectation, they will see something like this in the Daily Telegraph. You know, robots could could, could help detect cancer in less less than a second. And this is happening. This, is, this capability is there now. And in this particular case, this AI system was able to detect cancer, malignant polyps, just from looking at the shape and the growth patterns of the polyp. This is before the get of the actual pathology data. And when you think that 40,000 people present with this condition of bowel cancer every year. You know, there's a real need to be able to detect these cases very, very quickly. 
And when people see this, they think, well, it's available, why aren't we using it? But of course there's more, isn't there? The chase is on to develop the algorithms. There's, there's a radiologist called Hugh Harvey, who I go a lot of time for, he's a very, very bright man. And, and when he talks about data availability in the NHS, he sort of likens it to, to being on top of an oil well and not being able to drill into it. In England alone, we're producing, what, 40 million examinations a year? So across the UK, it's probably 50, 55. Why aren't we doing something about that to, to curate this fantastic data set that we can use to teach and to train algorithms? And we're not doing it. In certain hospitals, got arrangements with, with um, academic institutions or with, with companies like Google. It certainly happens a lot more in the United States. In fact, you know, we, when we talk about the United States, you know, this, there's no doubt that at the moment, and I'll say at the moment, they are leading it. They're leading AI in the world in medical uh, capability. And the Association of, no, sorry, American College of Radiologists is the, is the body behind RSNA, the Radiological Society of North America. And um, they've set, set up a, a data science institute. Are we involved in that? Oh, where, where are our links to this? Hugh has talked about the need for a British radiology artificial um, intelligence network, or BRAIN, as he calls it. And again, that, the whole purpose of that is to get a fantastically massive, accurate, curated database of images. I'm not privy to all conversations that take place, but as far as I'm aware, we're not having that conversation at the moment. So AI and radiology, I'll, I'll rattle through these very quickly, otherwise the uh, you know, time will be uh, moving on. How can it be used? Automatic image analysis. So uh, automatically, as soon as the image is done, it, it gets sent away for evaluation, automatically. And I'm not saying that's the only thing that happens to it, it will be reported afterwards, presumably. But the machine could be having a first look at that, um, that, machine, uh, that um, image. And the one thing it will do is it'll speed the process up, so it'll flag up abnormal ones so they get seen quicker. Very beneficial for cancer diagnosis, very useful for trauma. And this is the sort of thing I'm talking about. This is uh, uh, from uh, Radiology, the RSNA magazine. This algorithm was developed just to identify normal chest x-rays. And I think they use something like 400,000 normal chest x-rays. Because we know how a chest x-ray can look, a normal chest x-ray can look abnormal, can't it? So what they do, they, 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 they ran this machine, they train this machine with 400,000 images to make it able to detect all normal chest x-rays. And if you think, you might think, so, so what? Think about the application of this in the third world, where you can hold your mobile phone up to an image, take one picture of it, and the phone can tell you which patient should be referred on this. Enhancements of images, we're probably more familiar with this than, um, than most other things. And if you look at this, yes, we've all seen this, manipulation of your CT controls or MR controls to get that best possible image. This is something that's been around a long time. Then we've got clinical decision support and scheduling and acquisition, positioning possibly even in the future. And if you look, this is where the companies, and I've chosen Siemens here, but I think you could go to any of the big manufacturers and they'll be very interested in this particular field. To put these bolt-ons onto their, onto their kit to make your lives easier and to sell equipment.
this is just going to talk about low, you know, detection of low TB or pulmonary nodules. But again, this could be any application for any plain film imaging. You know, the algorithms are just developed for a specific purpose. And the one thing it does, you see, it's not just about being able to flag up images which are normal or abnormal, or maybe even giving you a, a, a differential diagnosis. But it's about, it's about improving quality as well. Because what this study uh, showed was that everybody who was using the equipment got better, whether you were a novice, whether you were experienced. And one of the arguments is that it, it just levels out the playing fields, makes the quality just better across the board. And if you can do that, why wouldn't you do it? And this again, it comes back, it's not about replacing people, it's about quality. And this really leads on to it, it's acting as a second reader. You know, we use it, it in some places it's used, you know, two sets of eyes view the same image because it's a, it's a gold standard. And if you've got that capacity and you're able to do that, you're going to do it because you know you'll get the best possible outcomes. It just so happens that in this case it's going to be a machine rather than a human providing one of those uh, reads. And there we are. It can be used in any application. Here's one for you know, and you could you could you could troll the internet, and and there are just dozens and dozens and dozens of examples like this out there. Some things I find more interesting, a bit scary, and when you see something like this, and you think, on the one hand, yes. You'd want to know because you want to have the earlier intervention. Maybe something could be done. Another part of me says some, some things you still don't know about. But the capability is going to be there and it's going to be used. I want to focus now on companies because obviously, you know, we will be using this equipment across the world. It'll affect radiologists, it'll affect radiographers. The drive at the moment is coming from the smaller companies. And again, I've, I've chosen Signify Research here. And what they, they, they I, project you all right? It's, yeah, it's, what this is talking about now is startups. It's a, very much a, a, a US bias to it. But look at the figures which are going into startups. Huge investment. And the reason why such huge investments are going into this field is because the rewards will be enormous. It's also interesting to look at how, there's, there's a publication just come out from, from the European Union, you, you, you may have heard of it, it's a sort of pan-European body. Um, we're not part of it, are we? Oh, well, we might be for another couple of weeks. But it's a fantastic AI document, and it, I would encourage you to look at it. Because what it does, it looks at the priorities of different countries. And if you look at the US, it's all market-led. Because that's the way, that's capitalism for you. And they are the biggest spenders, the biggest investors. If you look at China, China is, China's ambition is to become the leader in AI by 2030. Their focus at the moment is on research and patents. Because they want to call on the market. The EU, somewhere in the middle. Where that will leave the UK when we're out of that, out, outside the tent, I don't know. But it'll be one to watch out for. The other thing to bear in mind, of course, is, well, we'll talk about that one from the obstacles. And there you can see, it gives you an idea of where the investment is going. So the focus is very much on general imaging and cardiovascular. Even though I've talked a lot about chest x-rays tonight, the main focus is on general. 
Does anybody know any of those companies? Because I did not. But I was told earlier that if you go to uh, UKRC or whatever UKRC is now called, UKRO, thank you, Charlotte, um, you will see a lot more startups there this year. That's where the money is being focused. And I'll, get, I'll show you one. This is one example. Israel Zebra Medical Vision raised 30 million. And I guess that money's coming from, you know, places like private equity firms, you, um, hedge funds, you know, where they've got money to invest and, and, they, and they bank on big potential earners. But they, they, they train their machine with two million images to identify 40 different clinical findings. So I've said that the Americans lead, and if you go to, if you're lucky enough to go to RSNA, you will see you will, this is always a hot topic. I was lucky enough to be there two years ago, and, and it, it was fascinating. I love the dialogue, you know, because we have radiologists who are thinking, is there, is there a future for, for us? Is there not going to be a future? Will radiologists become a thing of the past? I, I don't think there will be. I, don't think there's, I think there will be a future for radiologists. There will be a future for radiographers who are reporters. Without question. Whether the structure of imaging changes is another matter. I would just say, look out for the, uh, this is the latest publication, Artificial Intelligence, just being released by um, RSNA, the uh, American, College of, American College of Radiology. Yeah, yeah. Volume 1, Issue 1, January 2019. So that's where you need to go, first of all, to find out about what is current, because you won't get anything better than that. So, I'm coming to the end now. So, we now start to look at what the obstacles are. One of the things, you know, we, you know, technical, the technical things will be sorted out. The network speeds, the data processing speeds, all that will get sorted out. The regulatory things are, could be interesting. And, and that's why I think we could arguably, and I've got no evidence to back this up, Arguably, we could be at a disadvantage here because we, we will be regulated. I would imagine in, in, in other countries, regulation will be less of a, an obstacle because they'll, they'll be fixed on the price, the price at all costs. And that's going to be a real challenge for us. The one thing that's not on there, well, you could say it's in there because we've got professional, uh, professional issues there is are we prepared, are we prepared as radiographers to do anything about this? Now the, C, the you know, quality, uh, care, what up, CQC, thank you. You know, you know what I mean. In their report of last year, you know, they said that um, it's gonna be revolutionized within 10 years. Good, and it will be. It will be. Will we be trading behind other countries? I would say yes. And they also said in there that, you know, which is something I agree with, the RCR believes that these will be seen as a diagnostic tool. I absolutely agree with that. So that all seems really good, very positive. CQC are going to do this and they're going to support us. There was a the Journal of um, Healthcare Computing, around about the same time, came out with this a sort of counter argument, and it said, "Who can, who, who, who can remember the paperless agenda? We weren't going to be using paper in the NHS. We're going to be totally digital. You know, the world's going to be a fantastic place, and we haven't achieved it. We're, str in fact, we are. We're still struggling in places to even." have a network of images moving around organizational boundaries and certainly going across organizational boundaries. So we, see, we got a lot of obstacles and it's not just about money, it's about
how we manage data within separate organisations. So there, what they said at the end of it was really that the NHS has a long way to go here. We'll, we, are, we will, everyone's going to be in front of us. Okay, what about us then? Come to the crux of it all now, right? Here we go. Who thinks radiographers have the skills? We'll do a show of hands here. Who thinks radiographers have the skills to take a leading role in AI development? Yeah, minority, but still. There's a number of people out there saying yes, we have. Will that require and this is just for the people who put their hands up now, mind. Do we have the people with the informatics, the big data management expertise, who can contribute in, in, in a sort of a computer science sort of way? I think we can, I think just like radiologists might, because they're not no better place than us here. I would say any imaging reporter. They can contribute from that from the point of view of you know they understand reporting, but the black box I talked about earlier is very much the domain of the computer scientist. Do we have strong enough links with startups? I don't think so. I'm talking about radiographers. I know there are certain radiologists and the RCR. The RCR in particular are making great strides here, in all fairness to them. But you know, I think if, if this was our school report, it would say it could do better. We've got to do something about it. Do we need to be at the table? Do you, do you care how your car works? Switch it on, right? Switch it on. Works, drive it. <coughs> I could argue that both ways, really. Yeah. Just these some some things to go away and mull over later. But last two slides. One thing is, probably, well, you can't you can't see it. This bus is not going to stop. It's going to get faster and faster and faster. We are to get on this bus. Oops. We are to get on this bus now. Or we, we, we'll, we won't be able to influence changes in the future. And Sue talked about, remember Sue earlier, she was talking about how the profession has moved on in the last 25 years. I can actually look further back than that, you know. And we have moved. And as, she, as, as Sue said, we couldn't imagine what we would be doing today. So if we're going to think about the next 30 years, Think, think that there's no boundaries. There are no boundaries to what we can do. It's up to us to do it, to make those things happen. And it's going to be fantastic to be able to see in 30 years' time exactly where we are. Oh, I, I put that up, sorry, yeah. This, this is the scary slide. This is President Putin in... Uh, Talking in on this is from Russia today, talking about um, talking to children on Knowledge Day. Whoever leads an AI will rule the world. I don't think he was talking about <coughs> healthcare. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs>
consultant radiographer. And I'm just going to do a very basic talk as to how I got to where I am. Okay. So I thought I'd start off with the very, very basics. I know there are therapeutic radiographers in here, which I don't know a lot about the therapeutic side. And the diagnostic, but I'm guessing the pathway would be kind of similar. Oh, this is going forward, I don't know why this is doing this. But basically, I went through the four modules that I needed to do for a job. Why is it doing this? <laughs> it's doing it by itself. Sorry about this. Who's technically savvy? I think what it's doing is actually just. Um, it's got an automatic, isn't it? Yeah, it's got its time back. Oh, is it time? The slides are timed. Yeah, we have got it on PDF at that time. So I'm just a dark. Okay, so there we go. I'm not on the time setting. Well, I'll just speak quickly then anyway. <laughs> okay. So, qualified as a radiographer in 98, started in the world of breast breathing in 2000, and then I started the advanced practice role in the year 2002. To do this, I had to go through a few modules. The first one that I had to do is a clinical breast examination, client communication, and then I went on to do the ultrasound, the breast intervention, and I also did film reading. I finished that five years later by doing my research module. Now, the reason why I've mentioned these modules is because we live in a different day nowadays, and you need to evidence that you are working at the proper level. I've worked in units where you are in a unit and you spend, you do in-house training for, for example, film reading or your breast um, intervention. It's no longer like that anymore. You have to go through the proper validated courses. And even though if you're starting off at the beginning, it seems like a long way to go because it takes about a year to do each course. My advice to anybody who wants to go along that pathway just now is to do the year's training because it, this will serve you in the future. It's very, very important not to take any shortcuts but to do all of this. This again. So, sorry about this. This is just seems to be going forward. I don't know why it's going forward like this. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about this. So, accreditation. So, after working as uh, as a consultant, getting to the, the level of consultant after five years training, and I don't think it's any secret that I work independently. So I've been working independently as for ten years now, and I decided to go to do the accreditation route. So what does accreditation actually mean? When you go to the Society of Radiographers um, website, they define accreditation as the action or process of officially recognising someone as having a particular status or being qualified to perform a particular activity. So you've been recognised for the work that you are saying that you are doing, not for what people think that you can do. And it's a way to, um, to show that you are competent at work and get the appropriate level. So how do you do this? Right, to touch this again in case it floats forward. How do you do this? Again, we live in a day where I'm a consultant and the hospitals would just have you doing clinical work if they could all the time. But it's not like that anymore. We need to be working to various domains. Now, to be an advanced, advanced practitioner, what they would, would like you to do is to be working at four levels. And the four levels that we are working towards are the expert practice, so clinically expert, 
which if you're an advanced practitioner or a consultant radiographer, you should be clinical expert at that role. But they also want you to be working, showing professional leadership and consultancy, education, training and development, and research and evaluation. As an advanced <coughs> practitioner, you need to evidence that you're working towards that. As a consultant radiographer, you need to evidence that you are working at that level. The one, the out of all of the domains, probably the easiest one to show that you are working at is the expert clinical practice. For me, daily basis, I'm film reading and reporting, I'm doing breast biopsies, anything like that, you can, you can, you can evidence it very, very easily. But there are other ways that you can evidence that you're working at the expert clinical practice by ways such as audit, performs, which is a national tool for people who work in the breast screening, which we can <coughs> show how we're doing. I work as a breast lead in a unit, lead at the MDT, and again, working with autonomy. So you can easily evidence the clinical aspect of your, your role. Professional leadership, how can you do that? Again, taking accountability, the lead radiographer, working with other modalities, for example, in the MDT, and at the very bottom there, undertaking accreditation. So that is a way that you can show your leadership in your modality. And again, education, training and service, development, audits, trainer, I have trained radiologists as well as radiographers, mentor junior doctors, and one of the roles that I'm doing at the moment is that I work out with Ghana and I'm the breast lead for working, doing charity work out in Ghana. So there are lots of ways that you can evidence all of this. And research, I've had some research published, which I've worked, published in America and various places across the world. I also think there's a role as a consultant to be a mentor. When I started on my pathway, going towards accreditation, I had consultant radiologists or radiographers who helped me on my pathway, so I feel as if it's important for me to be a mentor to others, so I mentor radiographers and also consultant radiologists. So that's part of the, what I've been doing. So now we get down to the accreditation side of things, and how do we do this? We all go to study days, we all go to things like this, and at the end of the study day, we will all get a certificate of some kind to say that we have been there. So why not use the certificates that we have? Instead of putting them in an, into a folder and your filing cabinet somewhere, why not use them using CPD? Now this is a really, really useful tool, and I have to admit, it took me a long time to get around to using this tool, but when I started to use it, I was very sorry that I hadn't used it before. So all the certificates that I gain, I upload it onto this tool and it's there, make a few words and I can always come back to this at a later date. So why did I want to be accredited? Recognition that I was working at the appropriate level. If I'm not accredited, how can I tell that I'm working at the appropriate level? Everything, like I said before, is documented these days. No more is it you say you can, do, you can do something. You have to show that piece of paper that you have the evidence to do it. And it makes everything robust by, going, by being accredited. So going through the radiography side of things, it made it easier slightly to go through the medical route. And the reason why I go, went through the medical route it's because, as I said, I work independently. I don't, I'm not employed by a trust, I'm not employed by Ian Health. I've been working this way for 10 years. The accreditation through the medics is, is, very, is very, very difficult. But because I had started, I had the CPD from the radiographers, I could use that amount of work to go onto the medical side of things. So all the work I had gathered from my CPD got uploaded into the format I showed you before, but then I had to talk about things like the scope of work, significant events, complaints and compliments, and my achievements and challenges. This is more things that I had to talk about, more than we had to talk about as a radiographer. So they wanted a lot more information that, that I initially had to give. 
going through all of this process, it takes about an hour now, but the first time I did this, it took about two hours because they hadn't accredited um, a radiographer before. So there was a bit of to and froing and questions as to how I did it and what that what my role was until we could kind of come to some kind of solution and an agreement as how they could accredit me in the future. So now it's fine, they know who I am. We got a plan put in place and that they used my plan, which is different from the doc from the doctors, but it's suitable for me. When I was looking through all of this, with the questions that they asked me, I realised that they were really looking to check 12 competency skills. And it's things like teamwork, reliability, motivation, things that we're all doing anyway as consultant radiographers, even advanced practitioners, even radiographers. So we're doing all of this anyway. It's just that you just need to think, you know, this is what they're asking me and how can I evidence all of this? So going through the process of all of this, it does have an impact. And the positives first is that you are doing more than what you realise that you are doing. You know, when you spend time speaking with uh, junior doctors or radiologists or radiographers, taking them through something that they need clarification for, showing them something, and you evidence this, you do realise that you are actually doing quite a lot. You just don't, didn't realise that you're doing as much as you do. And recognition, so I'm recognised by the doctors as well as the society as well. And I'm a person who likes to put things in order, so for me, mentally, everything's in order. That's just the way that I work. Negative impact. Time. It takes so much time. We're all working nine till five, eight till six, five days a week, and there is no way that you can do all of this, what they want you to do, collect the information, do all write everything down in a format that is needed. You can't do this in your daily time. So you do have to work in the evenings and at weekends. At least I've had to do that anyway. So, but short-term pay for long-time gain, I think. So, it can, it can be valid, validated by the doctors, but as well as radiographers. The study days that you attend, use the certificates that you have got and use the CPD now to upload everything onto there. It's so useful, but it does take time. I have already been told I've got to revalidate, um, which is a cycle that the doctors go through every five years. And um, every so often I get little emails popping up where I have to help a doctor revalidate, so I'm guessing I'm going to have to go through the same process myself. But I'll be prepared for this. I'm going to collect all the evidence, everything will be uploaded, I'll be able to have communication with the people who want to accredit me. So I should be prepared to do all of this. And I th thought that was a really good slide, be prepared not scared, because if you're prepared to do all of this, then going through the accreditation process should be a lot more easier and not better for you to do all of this. So that's how I did it, very, very talk, short talk, but it can be done. And the other thing is, if I can do it as I'm an independent practitioner, if you want to do it, anybody can do it basically, um, I can do it, you can do it, radiographers, and especially the radiographers who are coming up behind me, because I've been doing this job for hundreds of years now, so people coming up behind me, you can, you can do it, it can be done, it just takes time and order. and for managing the technology. It's always challenging when that happens, but really well done. And I'm sure, again, lots of questions for you. It's very interesting to think of you accrediting with the GMC <coughs> model and how that fits alongside sort of competence and the other work that's happening nationally, both in England and the countries around sort of virtual academies for advanced and consultant practice. So, but really good to hear about the plug for CPD now. So uh, we can talk about that later. So great pleasure to introduce uh, Sheila, Sheila Hassan, known to many of you I'm sure, works at Guys and St Thomas's, so on home, home turf here, to talk about your role in Stereotactic and the project you're running here at uh, Guys and Thomas, and I think a bit of a reflection of your career as well, so thank you.
Thank you, Charlotte. Yes, there's definitely a theme um, tonight about reflections of where we are. Um, just to say that I've got no loyalties or, or um, conflicts of interest. I'm particularly putting that a lot of my slides are of um, equipment. So I just want you to make sure, I have tried to use lots of different manufacturers um, to keep me um, safe. Okay, so when I was given this difficult to topic, um, I thought, well, actually, my career actually helps, will help you to understand this. Because I recognise that the majority of people in this room are diagnostic radio -oculars. So I thought it would be quite useful to sort of have a background about where we've come from. So up on the screen, you've got two um, early radiotherapy um, machines. Um, on your um, left is a cohort machine, and on the right is a very early linear accelerator, both of which I've pretty much worked on, okay, um, which is a bit scary. Um, when I first qualified, things were pretty basic and, and pretty archaic, I have to say. Um, how do we do our treatment? We relied on surface anatomy. We all knew our surface anatomy, exactly the same like diagnostic radio -oculus. Um and we did big margins to make sure we didn't miss anything. So it was real basic stuff. Um, but we, we cured people and helped them on their way. Um, our basic simulator was basically, we were very lucky at guys, um, because we had a simulator. That was quite unique. It was an old um, diagnostic machine that somewhere on mine blew up. Um, and we used that. And right at the beginning of my training, we were doing wet processing, um, which was also a little bit scary. And then we moved slowly into being able to borrow the, uh, the equipment up in the dark room in the diagnostics and having to, to go miles just to process some film. Okay then, so um, at that time, uh, those of you who can remember, the training of diagnostics and therapeutic medical was, was the same. <coughs> we covered the same ground and we shared, we shared our training. And then in the second year we, set, we went our separate ways and pretty much after that, never the twain shall meet. And the relationships between diagnostics and therapeutic was very poor, I have to say. It was very much um, never, never meeting a diagnostic, and if you did, it was horror, and uh, you, we can't possibly talk to you, um, which wasn't really good for the profession. <clears throat> Interesting enough, though, there was dual qualification, so there was a few people out there who would do both diagnostic and therapy. Charlotte was one of these people, despite the fact that uh, we weren't terribly friendly towards each other. <clears throat> I then left the profession quite soon. I left to have my family in uh, late 1980. And I took 19 years out. And things haven't changed much. I, I came back to Guy's because geographically that was a suitable location for me to go to work. And I was put back on the original cobalt that I trained on. The curtains were the same. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the room where the old simulator was sitting there, unused, and some of our equipment was just incredibly ancient. But things started to move. Okay, first of all, you had to direct entry into profession. You had diagnostic and um, therapeutic radio workers doing degrees, so it was different. We started separating more and more. Um, simulators were getting to be more common practice, and that guys we were fairly advanced. So it's to uh, put that there because I know some departments weren't still using simulators, um, and there were there were four specifically for radio therapy use. So people were beginning to get like, the idea that patient set up and reproduce it was very important. Some of us had our own dark rooms and others shared with our, continued to share with our diagnostic department. And then basic image um, verification came in. So instead of just hoping that we got treating in the right place, we started imaging our patients. So imaging started coming in for the first time in radiotherapy. They are paid away, we had a cassette, a stand to plonk it on, and we sort of, a bit like a music stand that you sort of jiggled about and hoped for the best. Um, but we did it, um, and we were then able to start reproducing our setups and verifying with the um, images called iViews. It was very basic, we used rulers, do you remember rulers? Image magnification factors and pinpricks to check acceptability so before our clinicians had to sign everything off. And it was still a bit of a hit and miss um, procedure. Again, things started to move on, and then we started having computer planning. And that's when things started changing, and also the introduction of CTs in radiotherapy. That was a big change. So I thought you'd like to see some of our fantastic images. Okay, so that's a breast uh, image. We still, use, we still image our breasts, very similar to this even today, because it actually does provide all that we need to know. And uh, here's a good old right natural cold brain. Again, we still use these images today. 
Uh, and there are still parts of radiotherapy therapy that the good old fashioned basic stuff is all we need to do to make sure that we're actually, we're actually imaging in the right place. The only thing that's changed is the way that we make sure that things are in the right place, it's all electronic, got all the rumors and the magnification factors. Okay, so we hit the, the two, early 2000s, and this is where things started to change. I'm very fortunate having to come back in 1999 because I was ready for those changes. I'd done this massive um, return to practice, which had given me skills to adapt. Some of my other colleagues did struggle somewhat with the new changes. We had new linear accelerators, and we started getting integral KV imaging and CT simulators. We started off with clipping our image intensifiers onto things. We were wobbling around on the floor and <laughs> lining them all up. But slowly, the manufacturers were producing equipment that involved imaging. It was still playing film imaging a lot of it. CT hadn't quite hit it yet. And then we got the CT simulator. So there was a big problem there, because no deep in therapeutic measurement knew how to use a CT scanner. So um, the guys have always been in innovative, so we employed, we poached, a um, diagnostic radiographer from the diagnostics here and we, we had a superintendent, CT superintendent, who came and joined our team. And with her support and guidance and expertise, we were able to do our protocols and we were able to start introducing CT verification and CT planning and making sure that prior to, rated, prior to a patient's treatment, we had the best setups and things. Why was this so important? Well, along that change, cancer survival started to go up and people were living with their cancer. And it was important at that stage to recognise that actually, when I first trained, the main thing was, was to get people better. Prognosis was poor, people didn't survive, so all people wanted was to be cured. But actually, once you start getting cured, you don't want to live with your cancer. You don't want side effects that are worse than the cancer to start off with. So suddenly it started to get important that we were able to do things so that our patients had a proper life after the radiotherapy. Things changed a bit more, so radio operators then started being involved in image verification. We took the role away from our clinicians. They no longer signed off the ideas to make sure in the right place. Because we were better trained and under protocol, we then started doing this. I think this also liberated radio therapy a lot as well, <coughs> with the image verification, because radio operators took it over. And so slowly we were starting getting the skills that diagnostic radio operators were getting, without realising in many ways because we would start getting used to seeing images and images and more images. And so we were sort of beginning to build a, quite a lot of stuff that without realising. Because we were doing it, we had to have protocols and we had to have training. And then the next big thing, <coughs> CT planning was introduced. So that sort of brings us up very rapidly. And interestingly, in 2011, I joined UK Council and uh, Audrey Patterson was there, and she insisted that all council members went off, off to RSNA, and we were sent off to lectures. And we were given this task of reporting and writing out for, um, for the profession what we'd heard. I went thinking, what is a therapeutic radio for doing at a diagnostic conference? What? How ridiculous? Why am I going there? She sent me off on the subject of imaging brain tumors. Really? What did I know about imaging brain tumors? You'll find out a bit later on how important that talk was to me. The following, all, all I did was sit in that, in that um, talk, I wrote everything down. I hadn't got a clue what CT was. The following morning I had breakfast with one of my diagnostic um, council members who interpreted what I'd written so that I could understand what the CT jargon was, so I could actually remotely understand what I learned. But I learned a tremendous amount of that and I was very grateful that opportunity. You never know when you start cross-pollinating between two professions what you might learn. Today is very different. So I thought you'd like to see some of today's equipment because it is surprisingly similar to diagnostic equipment. Okay, so on the whole there's two, two manufacturers of um, linear accelerators. This is a very true beam which we have at Guy's Hospital. It's state of the art. You can see there are flaps on each side, that's the CT imaging. So it's integrated to CT um, thing. So we can do plain imaging, KV imaging, but we can also do um, 3D imaging as well. This is all part of the system, it's all built in, and that we can do real-time checking that patients are in the correct position before we turn the beam on. And in some cases, we can now do it as we go along as well. 
This is a Tony Sauka unit, which um, we've got over at St Thomas's. Um, again, I just put it in really to show you how much like a CT scan and that sort of thing it is. It's surprising how our equipment now is very similar. If you think about the couple of slides I showed at the beginning, things look very different from the diagnostics. Our equipment now is getting more and more closer to yours. And then here, here is the CT scanner. So all our patients have CT scans now. Most of you will probably know this because sometimes you facilitate the scores um, and sometimes you image, particularly on their MRI scan, sometimes with our masters as well, depending on the technique. So all our patients now have CT. We don't think about anything else anymore. And we're preparing to ensure that we get that margin of accuracy at all times. We're using mobilisation devices to make sure we can do that reproductively as well. So these are our images now, somewhat different. And um, you can see some of the colour washing there, which tells us whether we're on or, or whether we need to move. We can do um, millimetre movements to make sure that we treat exactly where we want to do. And here's some other ones here as well. So you can see the colour wash on that. And so these are what we look at all the time as we treat patients. We do regular imaging to make sure that the reproductivity of the treatment fields is exactly the same. And then the next interesting thing, um, and some again to you will be aware of this because you support us again with this, um, is that we do an infusion. Okay, so we have a CT image, we have an MRI image, and we join the two together so that we get everything as much as possible enhancements. So we, we, have, we use both um, imaging modalities to ensure that we get enough in information. Because particularly the work that I do now, we work with one millimetre of accuracy. So it's very fine margins that we have to be sure. So it's important for us to use as many of the image <coughs> modalities that are out there. We sometimes use pets as well, um, so that we actually know and be confident that we're bang on. Because one millimetre is nothing. So another piece of kit that's become very um, useful. I first saw this at um, RSNA as president. I was privileged to go to RSNA. I have to say I had a ball. I was amazed at the equipment there and what I learned. Um, and they demonstrated this to me. Is that now, um, this is a Philips one, that they um, are able to produce an MRI that is compatible for both diagnostic and therapy use. Isn't that amazing? Um, they, they, they've got the, um, the couch can come off, off and on, uh, depending whether you do diagnostics or therapeutic. Very important in smaller departments because not every um, medicine department can afford or have the space or the capacity to own their own um, equipment. And so that we can do this. Um, so um, we're often sharing the MRI with diagnostics so they can interchange the couch so that um, we're, we're confident of this. That's quite important, that's just to give you a little bit about the couch top, because that's quite interesting and it's very important, it's quite easy to attach. We don't have one here at this hospital, but they're in, they are in use at least two hospitals in this country. And then we go to the MRI LINAP, which you've probably heard a bit about in the news lately, because they've just started treating their very first patient. So, we're talking about, you know, imagine what the future is, Sue mentioned about the future. The future of major therapy is moving really fast. Who'd have thought, you know? That we've got two, two, um, two departments who are doing the research on the MRI and INAC, which means that we can also, well, there'll be a time when we'll be able to do CT and MRI um, imaging, real time imaging for our patients. Again, getting those margins down. The less healthy tissue we treat, the better it is for the patient. We want to make sure these patients these days, they can live 40, 50 years of them post their radiotherapy. We want to make sure that they have the quality of life that we all deserve when we're fit and well. And this is what it's all about. Yeah. And it's important because we do a lot more stuff with soft tissues and things, which is where the MRI comes in really handy. So I'm just going to link that into my job today because we're talking about where diagnostics and therapeutics are connected. This conversation and this, this um, presentation came about with a conversation I had with Bodhi about my amazing new fantastic job that I've now been in for a year. That just gives you a definition of what um, SRS is all about for those who aren't sure. And it's really amazing technique. Treating brain tumours within one millimetre. We can treat anything up to 10 of these at one session. Isn't that amazing? One beam of radiotherapy can go around and treat all 10 
in one go, and sometimes we have to do it in two goes. And this is done only because we have the technical support of the diagnostic departments as well. I work very closely with diagnostics. I now have an amazing relationship with our diagnostic colleagues. I think it probably helped a little bit because I was a president, and when I walked, first I walked into my MRI department um, to ask them for if I could have an MRI scan, they looked at me and said, we recognise you, because they see my photo in the city. Um, so that obviously helped. So, you know, one of the best ways to get on with your colleagues in diagnostic therapies is actually just to get to know them, because it's that personal contact that makes all the difference. I was quickly then able to get um, our reserved appointments because as you know, MRI capacity is challenging. And I have, a, I have a, another colleague in my department who just can't work out why I always get my MRIs. And that is because we have a very robust relationship. If I don't need one, I let them know as soon as they can so they can use that appointment. And by the time to manage an extra one, they usually can accommodate that for me. So that is really key. I needed some training on packs. Um, the radio, neuroradiologist gave me some um, training on packs because part of my role is to prepare and make the list of the images that we're going to review. I chair an MDM um, and so I need those images at my fingertips. I got my basic MRI training from a colleague on the London Regional Committee because I also own my London Regional Committee. As we were saying earlier about getting involved um, doing CPD and things, and that also gives you connections just by going to study days and things, you start meeting other people. You never know who you might meet or when it might be useful at any one time. And I have to say, it's been so useful as well to know more people. So I just rang um, my, with, um, my mate up and said, I'm about to do stuff on MRI, I don't know anything about it. Can you give me a basic lecture that you give to your students so that I've got some <coughs> idea of what to do? And I've recently done the MRI anatomy course out at Liverpool University, which is Year two therapeutic major offers. I had six weeks to learn the entire MRI anatomy of the whole body, um, it, which I did, um, and it's been incredibly valuable for that. Um, I have a big team. Our team is um, supported by neuroradiologists. We can't actually treat a patient unless a neuroradiologist has been involved in the process at the end of the end, but also in the processes of outlining the organs, the risk, outlining the area that we're going to treat for Field. It's valuable for me to have um, a course at short notice. The serotactic radio surgery pathway is just two weeks. So it's a very fast turnaround and we've got to get these patients on and treated. And so we need all these systems to line up. And this is where those relationships are so key between our two professions. Because uh, as the um, waiting time and targets keep going down, and soon all patients will be expected to be treated within two weeks of diagnosis. To do that, we have to have our good relationships between both professions so that we can work in tandem with this. The neuroradiologist also helps with radiotherapy planning. And who's to say that that role can't be taken over by reporting radiography in years to come? You know, things move at a fast pace. As I've already mentioned, we do CT and MRI fusion on a regular basis. Um, and it's, it's working in collaboration, but I think is probably the most important thing. I can't do my job without the support of diagnostic colleagues. Um, and uh, it's great that I, I can do that. Um, and it's great that my patients benefit from that. And I thought none of this talk would be, um, would be missing if I didn't mention patients. We do share the same patients, whether we like it or not. You know, your patients will come into, the, you know, some of your patients will end up in a radiotherapy department for treatment. So we have that common. We share the same um, documents as well, so an amazing document, the value-based radiography document that's come out recently um, is applicable for both diagnostics and the therapeutic radiographers. The four P's of patient, public, practitioner partnerships, again, common in both professions. Independent prescribing, that's very key to, to therapeutic, and one day diagnostics will get that opportunity to be independent prescribers. And of course research. We can join together, we can use our expertise, and work together to make sure that we get up-to-date knowledge and understanding about how we do things. So the future. I see the future as more collaboration. Possibly we might see the return of dual communication. Who knows? Certainly therapeutic radiographers are certainly going to need an awful lot more diagnostic skills. 
and we need to start thinking in the diagnostic community about what you can do to offer us as well. It shouldn't just be us getting the, the skills from you. Diagnostics have got roles in therapy departments as well. We just need to work them out. We're not quite there yet, but we've already heard tonight how things are fast moving, how things are changing. There, should, you know, there, there will be a place for diagnostics and therapeutics. Obviously, um, there's also uh, a commonality in um, shared lectures um, in CPD and UPO, um, which is the new day for UKRC. Um, I joined together, I think it was two, two or three years ago now, and, I, and when I went the first time, it was so useful to go to a conference that had diagnostic and therapeutic talks. So I, I could go into some diagnostic talks. I knew where my job was headed for, I knew I needed some information on MRI, and those talks were sitting there waiting for me to access. And it was absolutely brilliant to be able to have a feel that I could just drop in to whichever lecture that I felt was suitable for me. You never know what you can learn from each other. One of my biggest regrets at the moment is at the MDM, um, I go to several MDMs, and the, the diagnostic visual report is missing currently. We've got, we've got all sorts of allied health professionals sitting in that MDM. You know, we've got the therapeutic bedroom for going into the MDMs. We need to make sure that more diagnostic bedroom was go to MDMs. You have the expertise and the understanding about um, images. That part is currently missing, so that's a real growth area that we should be looking at. There are ways of diagnostics in MDMs. We just need to make sure there's a bit more common. And finally, I'd like to say that I, what we won't hear any longer and I apologise for this soon, is that we, I'm, I'm no longer here at a radiotherapy conference, I'm a diagnostic radiographer and I'm an imposter. Because I'd like to see that we're all together. Thank you. Fantastic insight and review actually of my own career, I feel, looking back at diagnostic and therapeutics. So really important messages there about collaboration and working together with colleagues. Great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who's uh, Professor Alison Leary, Professor of Healthcare Modelling. And I first met Alison with some, through some national work, again linked to collaboration on the Advanced Clinical Practice Framework with Health Education England we've been working on. We've been working really widely with colleagues across the disciplines, so making sure that radiography is represented there, but also learning from colleagues, so important. I again was fortunate to touch base again with Alison last week, because you're doing some work on modelling the cancer workforce across London, and I know Nick Wasnitz is also involved in that and known to this audience. So, great pleasure to invite you here to talk about workforce modelling being key to delivering the imaging cancer services of the future. Thank you, Alison. Thank you. <laughs> Fonny asked me to talk about bulletproofing your career or your prospects. Um, I am a workforce modeller now and I've, I've come into that by accident really. Uh, I've, I've got a strange sort of background in engineering and nursing and medicine and all sorts of things. Uh, but mostly I work in computational mathematics now. And we get big sets of data and we look at it and we look at patterns in it. Um, and we started to look at workforce uh, a few years ago. Um, and this is really, uh, I guess, <clears throat> just sharing some experiences and some of the things I've learned uh, over the last 10 years. Um, I work at London South Bank University, which some of you may be familiar with. Some of you might have even trained there, I guess. Uh, we've got quite a big radiography department. I'm sorry to say I don't go there. I'm going to have to go and change that. Um, and I also am a professor of advanced practice at the University of Southeastern Norway. And on Monday nights, I normally go to Norwegian classes. <laughs> so you're giving me the night off. Shumla <laughs> Bram. <laughs> so, um, what I do at the moment, uh, we're quite a small team, but we work with lots of different people. And we're interested in workforce. Not just healthcare workforce, it's um, the workforce across the board. Um, we particularly look at workload and its effect on safety. That's quite an important thing. Not often looked at in healthcare, I have to say. Um, what we're really interested in modelling, though, is demand. So, if you look at the way the healthcare workforce is modelled currently, it's modelled from what we think of the supply side. We think about how many people we can afford to train. 
not how many people we actually need. So what we do, and what we're doing with the cancer project, is demand modelling. And it's really, I'm not a radiographer, um, but it's been really interesting listening to the talks tonight. And certainly I've got about a million questions now, so um, these guys are going to have a really hard time after this because I'm going to be calling them and asking them lots of questions. So, one of the things that I found really interesting when I came into modelling workforce, I used to model cancer, I worked for something called the National Cancer Action Team, some of you might even remember that. Um, well, we used to have cancer networks and I started modelling a bit of cancer workforce then and we modelled things like the two week wait. So, um, when I came into workforce modelling in healthcare, I found that there was, people didn't use the evidence at all. It was pretty much an evidence free zone, which really surprised me. Being a, being a researcher, uh, lots of people are doing workforce research, but hardly any of it ever translated into policy. And that's quite scary, really, when you think about it. So the, the kind of policy is going this way and workforce is going that way, uh, and never the two meet. So we try to help influence policy um, by using research. The world of work is changing. Uh, that there are no jobs for life anymore, the nature of the NHS has changed. Um, certainly in nursing, 45% uh, of registrants now don't work in the NHS. They work for other providers. So that, that kind of model, the, the workforce modelling that, that we kind of still do is based on like a 1970s car factory. But actually the work's changed a lot. Um, People have different expectations from work. I'm, I'm, I'm very much Generation X, uh, but, but the, the youngsters coming through have very different expectations of what their working life will be like. So, you know, we kind of need to adapt to that, I think. And the nature of work is changing. Now, this is the really important bit, because we've heard, um, particularly Sheila's talk, actually, about the advancement in technology. And, and over her, her career, how things have changed. The pace of change is incredibly rapid. The care that we provide is becoming increasingly complex. There is more risk in the system. Patients' expectations are higher. And yet we're still modelling our workforce like it is the 1970s. So we need to think about that a bit, I think. So, my seven top tips. The first one is understanding um, and defining your jurisdiction. What is it you do that nobody else can do? Before I came here tonight, I'd really had problems with that. You know, um, you guys have got big machines, and it involves radiation. <laughs> um, just sitting here for an hour or so, I know a lot more about it now. But that's because I've sat here. So, what is your jurisdiction? What is your unique selling point in radiography? I think it's going to be increasingly important to define it and tell people about it so not just amongst yourselves but everybody else um, I think that there's something about uh, when, when we do any kind of workforce modeling what we try to do is look at what outcomes you're trying to achieve uh, rather than what you're going to deliver and, and what do you need to deliver to, to, to think about the outcomes so what are, what, are, what are good outcomes for you guys what's your contribution to think about that as well, I think. Um, some other professions, nursing in particular, become overly flexible. They don't have jurisdiction. Uh, it's really difficult to define where their work stops and ends, and, and they just build up all the gaps left by other people. And that's caused quite a few issues in terms of modelling, so we don't know what things like safe care looks like. So being able to understand the demand for what you do and identify what your jurisdiction is, is really important for a sustainable future, I think. <clears throat> One of my favourite things about working in healthcare modelling is um, this, being a mathematician is sometimes quite difficult in that I get kind of frustrated when people believe in something called determinism. One thing follows the next thing, follows the next thing, follows the next thing. And I was very surprised to find that in healthcare, uh, the workforce is seen as the people that deliver tasks. And you deliver a series of tasks, with or without smile. Um, but then all you need to do then is transfer people sort of up skills escalators, but your work is a lot more complex than the de delivery of tasks. 
There's one group that's seen as the predominant sort of knowledge intense occupation, which is medicine. And then everybody else sort of does stuff that's allied to it. I don't know if that's where the term allied health clinic professionals come from, actually. I've just had that thought. You need a distinct identity in that case. Um, because what you do is very different and what you do is unique. So it's what is your unique contribution to this? <coughs> sort of, um, it just being a, a set of tasks. For quite a long time, we've really seen this in the last five years, particularly as austerity has hit in healthcare. There's a push to what we call a widget workforce. So that's what the Lego guys are. Um, and this is a, this, there's been a dream for a long time in a lot of work that's planning in a lot of industries that you can have this generic worker that will fill lots of different jobs. Um, it's pretty much been discredited in the 1970s and 80s, but it's, it's kind of hung on in, in health, and it's really risen in the last few years that you can get a generic worker. Um, and it's quite a risky thing to do for, for somebody like me. What it does, this kind of skills buckets and skills escalators, you know, when someone's bucket's full, we put, put the work in somebody else's bucket, is it, it causes um, reductionism of the work. So we end up with things like tick box care. So um, Sheila's job sounded really complex, but someone might say, well, if you gave me a checklist, you know, I, I know a bit about physics, you gave me a checklist and, and what to do, would I be able to do it? Well, no, of course I wouldn't be able to do it, because I wouldn't understand the risk involved or the situation involved. But, you know, I'm a nice person, I can press buttons, right? So there, there is that kind of thinking out there, particularly in, in some of the policy makers that I've met. So the management of risk, being able to articulate how you manage risk, is, I think, going to be increasingly important going forward, because this work is becoming more complex. This is the cost of this. So um, Twitter's a great, great source of data for me. <laughs> um, but th this is what's happened in nursing. So nursing really suffered from reductionism. You know, tick box care. This is this is what nurses do now. Um, I love I love this one at the bottom actually. Um, they, they did an audit, but people weren't answering call bells. So the, the, the answer was to have a teaching session on what patients might need if they press a call bell. So it's not. It's not even thinking about what the actual problem is. The problem is you might not have enough people to answer the call bells, obviously. Um, but it's this kind of reductionist thinking that's creeping into workforce planning, which is quite, quite risky, I think. So reject it. Tell people what you do. Tell people why people what you do is important. One of the things that lots of healthcare workforces don't explain to people is that they're a safety critical workforce. Um, it's quite interesting, if you put radiation and safety and workers in, you get a picture of Homer Simpson up. <laughs> That's great. He did come on and put radiographer in. I'll show you what came up when I put radiographer in. Um, but this is, this is the sort of stuff we work with. So we, we work a lot with um, safety critical high reliability organisations and we, what, we, what I'd kind of like to do is I'd like to get healthcare modeling, workforce modeling to be the same as a safety critical organisation. So essentially what we've got is, um, uh, it's usually the green box I'm talking about, which is safety management systems and how we use data to, to keep things safe. But what I'd like to say, so we've got the red box, which is demand, which we don't understand, um, but these organisations do understand it. And then we've got risk, and you guys manage risk a lot of the time, every day. And then a high reliability, a high reliability organisation, HRO, would put a very experienced workforce next to that risk and, and keep them there. It will pay them to stay there. Um, it's, it's trainees, it's rookies, we'll call rookie factor. Um, they would pass work back to, or it's assistive personnel they would pass back to, work to. That's a bit different to healthcare. So what we do in healthcare is we put all our rookies on the front line to manage risk. So some organisations, I don't know if this is, this is true in radiography, maybe you guys can tell me if it's true. It's certainly true in um, areas like nursing and paramedic practice and some of the AHP groups that we've looked at, organisations with 50 to 70% of their frontline workforce being qualified less than two years. Um, what it does is it, it, create, it, it helps the leaky, what we call the leaky bucket. So uh, these guys, want to do a good job, get disenfranchised and leave. So it's not a great way to manage your workforce. And we have a smaller experienced workforce, 
the rookies have to pass the work back to if they can't manage it. But that relies on the rookies deciding if it's if it's the right thing to do. Um, so this is not a great way to model a workforce. So my message to you there is make sure you promote yourselves as a safety critical workforce. This is actually the modelling for um, service industries, so things like hotels and hospitality. This is how they model their workforce. So, you know, you can kind of see the difference. This is one of my favourite quotes. It's by Rita Dare, used to buy oil fires. If you think it's expensive to hire a professional to do the job, wait until you hire an amateur. <laughs> so, <laughs> what these, what these, um, what HRI, HROs do is they will pay people to stay in the same job 20 years because they're really good at it, they'll pay them more money, they'll give them more opportunities. How do you guys get promoted? What happened, would you do? Did you go into management? So um, I'm guessing uh, jobs like Sheila's um, and Dawn's are actually pretty rare. Am I right? Yeah. So we need more people doing those jobs, right? Yeah. To make care safer. Reject substitution. Um, other workforces have kind of embraced substitution. So, so this is substitution for medicine uh, and healthcare. Substitution happens in other other professions and other industries too, but it's got a high cost associated with it. I'll, I'll talk about what the cost is. Um, the reason I've put this one in is because in I don't, do you know about the advanced clinical practice framework? Really, really good opportunity. The ACP framework, I think, is fantastic. Lots of people work really hard on it. It's a great idea to um, formalise, in fact, what, what people like Dawn have done and, and go through it. There's a consultant level practice one coming out soon, hopefully. But some employers have used this to fill their medical workforce gaps. So you've got people practising at the bottom of somebody else's licence, not the top of their own. So all that, all that unique knowledge. And I, I, I just happened to get a couple of emails from radiographers that have done this. They're taking emergency department ACP jobs, and, and then we're having some difficulties. So being a substitute is not never a good idea. The reason for this is in healthcare because we, we have that funny kind of peculiar way of modelling the workforce based on supply rather than demand. We have what's called a boom-bust approach. So we get oversupply of people, then we get undersupply of people. And actually the undersupply is becoming more dominant now as people are choosing to leave their professions. Um, so you end up just filling a gap. And then when the supply comes up again, you get pushed down by the, by the dominant workforce. Um, substitute workforces are not usually cheaper. There's a, there's a thing about whether they're, they're cheaper, but they're actually just more useful at the time, generally. They don't promote the unique selling point of your background. So, you know, what is advanced radiography practice? I'm really looking forward to hearing more about that. Really looking forward to hearing it. Um, relies on a large power differential. So the dominant group will let you in for a bit as long as they're under their control. So you never really kind of manage to progress unless you're unless you manage to negotiate, that's quite tricky. So for individuals it might work, but for populations it's not usually a good idea. Um, it's competency-based, not capability-based. So when we talk about capability, we're talking about expertise framework, of which comp technical competence is part of that, but it's more about the clinical decision-making, the clinical acumen, the judgment part. That's the bit about managing risk. And it's, it's what we think of as a cold sack career for a lot of people. So people will do it for a couple of years and be happy in it, but then realise there's nowhere to go because they don't belong to the dominant group. And the dominant group will see it as role incursion, territorial incursion. So um, when we, we kind of do this modelling, we think about what's the best way to redistribute the workload. Rather than those buckets, my bucket's full, so I'm going to put some stuff in your bucket. We think about the work overall and the risk how we can redistribute it amongst the best people to do the job. So there is no hierarchy of skills. Medicine is up here and, and, and you know, um, pharmacists here. It's, it's not like that. At some point the pharmacist will be the best person, at some point the radiographer will be the best person, at some point the doctor will be the best person. And that's, that's how we kind of think about how we can manage safely. Own your agency. So I've not only been a colleague of radiographers, I've also been a user of radiography services. Um, and 
it's a very different experience. So as colleagues and, and talking to people, uh, so when I worked in cancer, I, I talk, you know, had lots to do with therapeutic radiographers, um, knowledgeable expert professionals. Being a patient is a very different experience because I started experimenting. I, I, I went for um, an MRI. And I get my brain MRI quite a lot. <laughs> um, and the guy before me just said, his ankle MRI, and he asked the radiographer, he's a doctor, and he asked the radiographer what the results were. He said, I don't know, you have to ask the doctor. So well, I'm going to do that. So I had my brain scanned. And I said, how does it look? I don't know, you have to ask the doctor. So I do it every time I go now, and I always get the same answer. So it looks like you guys know nothing. You just press the buttons, right? And I know that's not true. So own your agency, own what you own. And yeah, there might be about a million reasons why you can't. In fact, somebody once followed me to the, you know the lockers where you get changed? Where well, radio actually followed me and said, it's against the policy, I can't talk about it. I said, all right. <laughs> But, but things like this are about giving away your agency. So your agency, your knowledge, your skills, your expertise, people need to know about them if you're going to be a sustainable workforce in the future. So um, some of you might recognise where that sign is. I'm saying nothing. So we would like to call you a knowledge intense occupation. So this is, the, this is what, if you Google radiographer, this is what comes up. Do you think this is representative? No idea. Um, I guess you're not cartoons, for one thing. <laughs> but one of the things I did do, um, HEE have just started this a uh, lot of campaigns about getting people into the profession. So I looked at the radiography films. There's some little films on the internet. They're really good. They're very well made. But they talk about how nice you are. <laughs> you're lovely people and you love patients and you're so lovely. One person mentioned physics, but you are a knowledge intense occupation. If you don't show that, then it makes you replaceable, quite frankly. It's what's happened to nursing. Now we've got a whole bunch of associate professions coming in and replacing registered nurses. Um, and this is why, learning, learning lessons from others. So you're, you had a very good knowledge script, and now you're changing to what we call a virtue script. We're nice people, you can trust us. So nursing was relying on the virtue script for a long time, and particularly after mid-staffs, a big campaign called the Six Seeds, which really relied on how compassionate and kind and courageous you were. So talking about who nurses were, not what nurses knew. And of course, I'm guessing radiography, from what the data I've seen, is a gendered occupation. You, you seem to be slightly more female than male, actually quite a lot more female than male. And that's always a bit of a risky thing to be anyway. Um, so th this is the kind of things that, that this is, these have been tweeted to me in the last couple of weeks. Well, last week, in fact. So um, we've got the public now who believe, who've taken this on board, and think you don't need to know anything to be a nurse, you just need to be a really nice person. And you don't need to pass the exams. And just make the entry game wider and wider and wider. You don't need to be able to add up or read or anything like that. Um, and this guy at the bottom, he was, he was a classic guy, actually. Stick to the knee. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but nursing's this sort of innate skill that people have. It's, it's like, you know. um, so learning the lessons of others by not sticking to the virtue script, but showing right in the knowledge script, and, and, and I think Kevin's talk was really good for that, actually. Um, be at the table. As my, my friend Crystal Oliver said, be at the table or be on the menu. <laughs> And look to the horizon. Uh, I think it's really difficult when everybody's really, really busy and they're doing lots of work um, to actually look up and look around. But there are huge changes coming. Um, and, and one of the reasons <coughs> I found Kevin's talk really interesting is, is has anyone heard of the Top Hole Review? So it was published today. <coughs> um, so unfortunately, I didn't get to go to the launch of it, but I'm, I'm really keen to read it. About six months ago, there was an interim report, and I looked down the list of experts, subject matter experts. There were no nurses on it. So this is about the digital, digital uh, potential of the workforce, the, you know, the healthcare workforce. 
And I don't think it's an ideology on it either. I saw some clinical scientists on it. So when you've got big chunks of the workforce not being represented, you're not influencing policy. And you have the knowledge to influence policy. And importantly, you have the knowledge to make a difference to people like me that use your services. Thank you very much. Fantastic. I think that was a really good presentation to round that section off. We're now going to have a Q&A, but I think Foddy was going to allow us to do a five, ten minute leg stretch. I'm looking at you, Foddy. Is that all right? Yeah, I'm going to be a bit green. Okay, so welcome back. <coughs> We've now got a fantastic opportunity. The amazing panel of people here with different but strong perspectives on the future and what it could offer. And um, we're opening it up for questions, so I hope you might have some. I do have a couple of questions for the panel, but I will open it up to the floor to see if there's an, uh, an initial question from anyone who's uh, got something stored away from what they've heard. Yes. Oh, there's a, there's a microphone just coming. Thank you. If you could just introduce yourself by name and where you work. Hi there. My name's Mark John, I'm one of the advanced practitioner radiographers and I work at Western Sussex NHS Trust at Excellent. Worthing Hospital. Thank you. Uh, my question for the board is, linking in the last lecture about reductionism and how we need to move our progression forward, um, with um, artificial intelligence coming in, isn't there a risk that we might be <laughs> substituted as advanced practitioner radiographers in the far future, reducing the ability for people to move into the profession because less of us are needed? Yes. <laughs> sorry. Not good I enough. Could, sorry, I, I couldn't can resist that. Thank you very much. resist that, yeah. Look, I mean, you, I, I hear these same discussions with the radiologists. I, I mentioned RSNA. If you went there, they were saying that people are being turned off becoming trainee radiologists, particularly in the States, because they see there's no future. There is a future. I... What we don't know and what we have to imagine is what's the next stage of the advanced practitioner? What's the next stage of the consultant practitioner? Don't look, don't look backwards to see where we've come from and are we going to go back there? It's, it's up to us. Shall we ask some other panel views? Sheila, yeah. I'd just like to say something um, in the radiotherapy community. Um, we've obviously seen massive changes in, in a very short time. And, you know, when I showed my presentation a few years ago, we got, we got our oncologists to sign off our, our, our images. And all they used to do was squiggle on them. Okay, they barely looked at them. Okay, we took that role over. We developed it. We expanded it. And, and now we're doing it independently. That freed them up to do some other clever stuff. Because computer planning came in, techniques changed, things became more complex, um, patients' demands have changed. We don't ever know what the future is holding. What it will do, it will be a step towards something else and something far more exciting. Now I've had time to think about your question. A second go. <laughs> I, I can see a time coming when we won't have, we'll have regional services. This is, this is the way I see it. We'll have regional services. You will be employed on a regional basis. They could almost take out radiology from the, that particular hospital. It will be just a service which is provided by somebody else. And you could imagine that, that will be, there will still be radiologists. There will still be radiographers. Will those radiographers be radiology associates? Just, you know, who, we don't know. I mean, anything is possible. I think it's that opportunity for us to be able to shape that future, which is so important, and thinking about what is it that patients want to cross that pathway and what will our role need to look like, embracing all of that technology. So I think a lot of the panel, when they spoke, talked about that unknown part of the future, but we are the ones who can shape that. Alison, did you want to? There's, there's quite a long history of automation coming and taking people's jobs. 
Um, but generally, when the work becomes more complex, the workforce changes to, to adapt to it. I think it was Charles Darwin, actually, who, who talked about, you know, it's not the most intelligent or the strongest of the species mm. that survives, it's the one that's most adaptable to change. So, the, you know, and, and, and listening to um, Sheila particularly, how much radiotherapy has changed in the last 20 years, you know, that there's going to be a space to go into. Um, an advanced practice in 10 years in radiography, I'm sure, will look very, very different. So it's, it's about being the ones that lead the change. Dawn, did you want to add anything? Or? No, no not particularly? No, no nothing, nothing okay. about ordinary. I think another question at the back. Thank you. Hello, my name's Nicola, I'm from Imperial College, I'm a um, reporting radiographer. My concern again is for the, the AI versus what Alison was saying about the whole the button pushing. Not, my concern isn't so much about the advanced practice element of radiographers, we're developing that skill in many, many different areas, not just reporting. What concerns me more is the way that Kevin was saying about the AI and detecting those instant like chest x-rays and they can detect it instantly. That's what our band fives do in A&E. And what you're saying there is as this AI kind of develops and becomes common practice throughout all of our trusts, is you're essentially now turning our band fives and our newly qualified radiographers into button pushers. And we've seen it with how the algorithms have come into effect and making, you know, they're, you know, if you've seen it with as digital radiography comes into effect and the fact that they're not knowing, the band fives don't know their exposure factors off the top of their head, they are now just letting the computers do it. So they are devaluing their skill set and doing that. And what's concerning about this AI, I believe, is that fact that our band fives aren't going to really learn anything. They are the ones who are picking up these abnormalities because they're the ones who see those thousands and thousands of chest x-rays and are, they are the value for those A&E consultants and those baby, um, baby kind of practitioners in the ED departments. So I just wondered what your thought was on that. You saw the, the slide where, which from, from where I don't know that said, don't ask us, we don't tell you what the result is anyway. Mm. Right, so I could say, well, what, what's different from that, but is, it, is there more? There's more coming. I was just <laughs> going to counter that actually with we might not tell patients the results, but our band fives and our band sixes in ED do tell the consultants and the doctors and the emergency nurse practitioners our opinions and our views on that one. And I just worry that that's going to be taken away from our profession and our newly qualifieds coming up into the profession. I can't say it will never happen, but there still needs to be dialogue. About, just imagine this is a tool. There will still need to be dialogue between different clinicians, patients, about what, the act, what that means for them. So I don't think the dialogue with the patient will change. Uh, it, well, it certainly won't change for the worse. It will be better because you will be able to give a true and accurate record of whatever it is you find on that radiograph. Sheila? Um, I'd just like to say something to that. Our band five should be coming out of university able to red dot and comment on films, and we should be encouraging this. We aren't just button pushers. We should be encouraging them, and all people in diagnostic departments, in plain in Im imaging, plain film, whatever you want to call it, we should be able to and competent to comment on those films. It's our profession, it's what we've trained for for three years. I know we're not reporting, ra you know, they're not reporting radiographers, but if something is obvious on an x ray, they should have the confidence to say to that patient yes or no. Mm. It's different for CT and MR. Because obviously there's thousands, you know, hundreds, thousands of images, and you can't comment on it. But I think for, especially ED imaging, they should have the confidence to at least red dot or comment, and be proud of what of their profession, proud of our profession. It's what we've trained for. 
Thanks for that important point there, Sue, because pre preliminary clinical evaluation is a core skill at HCPC registration, and we should be utilising that. That's our sort of unique selling point, as Alison referred to before. We really need to move towards doing this. Three weeks ago, we introduced um, live um, artificial intelligence effectively in part of our planning processes. So we have um, a um, computer system called Brain Lab. Um, its role is to automatically outline tumours for us um, and to start the voluming and also to outline critical structures. What's that doing? First of all, it's giving the ability to do that for radiographers. It is currently a clinician, it used to be a clinician only job, it's no longer a clinician only job. Um, I anticipate that part of my role will be part of that. It speeds up the process as well, and it also makes sure that we guarantee that if there's a really tiny metastatic deposit in the brain, Brain Lab is going to pick that up, and then we can use our clinical reasonable skills to determine if that is a metastatic deposit or isn't it, should we be treating it now or not. That is going to result with better outcomes for patients. But this role that used to be taken by clinicians is going to be taken over by radiographers thanks to artificial intelligence. Yes, gentleman here. Did you want to add something on that, Alison, just before we take the next um, question? I, th I think your point is really, really interesting. And given that I, I don't really know anything about radiography, <laughs> but imagine, I'm guessing that um, the reason we have images is for human eyes, for humans to interpret. If you've got a computer interpreting it, do you need images at all? Yeah, that's... Mm. So then what, what are you guys going to be doing? And that point, actually, Alison, has been discussed at uh, various conferences in America, particularly in relation to radiotherapy planning. So actually, do you really need the images for planning? Because actually, if you can develop where the coordinates are, immobilize the patient, actually, why do you need the image? Yeah. And with genomic medicine and all of that linked together in a big imaging set, actually, what is the long-term value of seeing a hard copy image? Or not hard copy, that's my age, isn't it, on the packs? <laughs> it's a big question, though. Gentleman here. Hi there. <coughs> My name is Val. I'm one of the superintendents here at St. Thomas's Hospital in X ray. So, already we've seen the whole AI conversation, and it's already caused a moral panic amongst everyone here, including our band fives. Oh. Um, I don't think um, they're going to be out of a job anytime soon, definitely not. What we need to start doing is engaging with our band fives and with the society as well and start approaching the startup companies who are actually enforcing this and actually point, you know, knock on their doors and start saying, right, this is the skill set we have. This is what we can offer you, and then go from there, and maybe look into invest ourselves into those companies as well, and we can use band fives for that. So not only just training at the university level, they can then go and add additional skills with these startups because we need to embrace this change and stop this fear that we, we seem to have really, and I think that's the way forward. Your points would be great. Uh, can I add to that? I mean, if if you think about the four pillars. You know, what an advanced practitioner, consultant practitioner should do. Where's, where's the weakness in the, particularly the diagnostic radiographer role? And it, like, to me, it's always about research. We're getting better, but we're not, we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more work that we can be doing. Artificial intelligence opens up a completely new world for research. Data, data analysis, computer science, it's, it's, it's sort of ripe for researching from a, from a diagnostic radiographer point of view. So I, I, I agree with you that we should be engaging much better than we are with, with startups as an organization. I'm pretty certain we will be. But we should, always, should, we should also be encouraging people to get more involved in, in, in research, which, which is going to shape AI. Absolutely. Alice. You sort of cover, cover my question a little bit there, Kevin. You asked early on whether or not we thought radiographers should be around the table, and there were very few hands that went up. But as we've listened to the talks today, particularly Sheila's, 
I'm questioning why wouldn't we be? We have the knowledge, the skills actually sit within our profession. We are the ones looking at those images. When you hear Sheila talking about her collaboration with her diagnostic colleagues and developing her knowledge and skills to improve her positioning technique and outcomes for patients, if we embrace artificial intelligence, how much better can we get at that? When do we start not talking in millimeters, but in 0 0.000 millimeters for our accuracy? And that's where artificial intelligence can make a real difference. But we need to be at that table because we are the ones with the skills and knowledge on how we acquire those images. Not necessarily the interpretation of them, although I think that is a, an additional skill set that we also bring to the table, that actually, probably, we are the only profession that knows it end to end. And I think that actually we're missing an opportunity if we don't get to that table pretty darn quick. I agree. <laughs> so how many in the room know about the five imaging networks that there are in England, which are have government funding, to look at artificial intelligence. And they're not just associated with one trust. There's quite a number of trusts grouped around these different five networks. Do any of you know about, about this? I can see a nod from Fiona there. Excellent. <laughs> I'd expect you to know. <laughs> but clearly, there's then an opportunity. These were announced, I think, at the back end of last year. Um, and one of them, I know, is based at Guy's, Tommies and King's, a huge piece of work involving quite a number of different uh, hospital trusts beyond that as well and across the UK. So I think there's an opportunity there that we need to capture and we need to be at that table to try and engage with that. Certainly, I think the Royal College of Radiologists are there um, and we must make some inroads there. So I think there's something about us sharing that information again more widely with the community. Fiona, do you know anything more about, have you had any engagement from your sort of stakeholder position with these networks? Could you uh, just, thank you. Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot a bit. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> Um, very early stages, uh, there's five um, centres of excellence, that are, like Charlotte said, two looking at digital pathology, two looking at um, AI in imaging, and one looking at both. So Gla Glasgow's looking at both, um, the guys, Thomas's, King's um, collaboration, and Oxford, Oxford is the other um, imaging one and they've been given some money to work with industry, so it's um, through the Office of Life Science, it's part of the industrial strategy, um, and a combination with Innovate UK, and the, oh, Bayes, and I can't never remember what it stands <laughs> for, what was the uh, Department of Industry, but it's called something else now. Um, and they're looking at how that's developed, and the intention is therefore to put the imaging infrastructure in place so that AI can be spread <coughs> rapidly across networks. There is some more money ring-fenced um, that we're in the process of making the business case to draw it down from Treasury at the moment, and we're in uh, doing an options appraisal about what we should do with that additional money, and that is specifically for artificial intelligence and imaging and pathology. Mm, so yeah. watch this space. Hopefully, we have to make the business case to get the money from Treasury, but it is sitting at Treasury at the moment. And do you see opportunity within that? You might not be able to say, obviously, for, the, for our profession to be able to I'm engage with that, because sure I think we're at a be high engaged, level here, yeah. if we can... I'm sure we'll be engaging through the SCOR and the RCR. Um, Fantastic. It, I, to be honest, I've come quite late to the party on this one. Um, it's the new money that's just been ring-fenced that myself and my pathology colleague are, are becoming involved in. So um, we've, there's been lots of emails flying backwards and forwards between NHS Improvement and the Office of Life Science this week to get the business case um, outlined into Treasury to, to get that money. So that sounds like an excellent opportunity so for it is, us. It is brand new, hot off the press, and don't quote Fantastic. Me don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Tweet it. <laughs> Body, did you? Have a yeah, question? I just I had a question for Dawn actually because um, it is AI related. I think a lot of the um, progression we're seeing in AI here is certainly a lot of the talk is around uh, breast screening and first read, second read. I'd be quite keen to get your thoughts, Dawn, on uh, someone who works in that so closely in that part of the, um, of our profession. Whether you feel like that. Um, is uh, a threat to you in some way or how you can potentially see it as, uh, as actually an enabler, 
uh, particularly around this idea around the fact that we do need to double read in, in uh, mammography, in screening? I don't see it as a threat. I mean, in, in the breast world, there's also already something called CAD, C-A-D, Computer Aided Detection, which we use, or some places use it more abroad than what, what we do in this country. So I don't think it would be a threat to be able to use the equivalent of AI in breast. I think it would take a lot of work to see, um, because with the breast world, you need to be able to notice the normal variants. And with the breast, the, I mean, there's so much it, that the computer or the AI, AI would have to recognize. So I think in radiology, it would enhance the breast world, especially when there's such a shortage of breast radiologists anyway. So to have a single reader with some kind of AI type of device, I think would be very, very good. So not as, not as a threat, I think it would definitely be an, an enabler. Yep. Positive enabler, and I think given all the challenges we've got in the service, I know this isn't immediately around the corner as routine work, but given the reporting times from imaging, looking again at Fiona, you know, we've got some huge challenges coming. So actually, I think if we can optimise the use of technology as it's proven, we've got to engage with that. Absolutely. Yes, another question there. Thank you. It's great to have all these questions. Fantastic. Oh, hello there. My name is Roy Burnett. I'm the PAX manager at uh, Guys and Tommies. So interestingly about the um, AI being at the table, you, we, uh, as you mentioned the project that we've got going and we had it last week. We had a, a day and a half of a uh -huh. study and you, you, know, you could technically say I was at the table because I Fantastic. was invited. So <laughs> that was good, but it was very technical. So right. there are just two points I want to make. Uh, one, of them, one of the guys there was saying um, to get a good AI system, you need a good IA system, infrastructure architecture. So, you know, that's the first point, that has to be, that's paramount. And the second is, um, although it was discussed, that is still our data, the NHS data, patient data, which we're freely giving to these companies who may or may not make a lot of money out of our patient's data. I know it's going to be anonymized, but it's still our patient's data. And that's the thing that concerns me the most. Although, obviously, AI is a, is a fantastic concept and will be for the benefit of the patient in the, in the, in the long run. So I just wonder what you think about the data being given to these companies, possibly, and what we might get oh back from Oh, boy. <laughs> what do I think about data being given away? <laughs> I mean, you were, I, mean I, I think I, I tried to, to say more than once that there are... This is going to make, make a lot of people very wealthy. You know, we talked about startups going to... Uh, UK I.O. this year, uh, they develop products, very often they get snapped up by companies and everyone walks away with a couple of million dollars, you know. And it, it's, 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 yeah, it's, do you ever listen to Melvin Bragg, what's that moral, the moral, moral, <laughs> ma moral maze, you know, where they, where they discuss, discuss ethical problems? Mm. And it is a, it's, it's an ethical problem because the data is valuable. It's incredibly valuable. So you would hope that built into any contract with a company was a, a line somewhere saying, in the event of somebody making a lot of money, then a lot, some of that, a fair proportion of that, is returned to improve patient care within the NHS. But I don't write contracts with these companies. Next question is, who is, I wonder? Just, just before I take your question, can I ask you about your ongoing engagement in that work? Will you be invited to, yes, to continue that contribution? Because that's really important. I, yeah, I'd Exciting. imagine so. I don't, I don't know anymore. It's, it's a very technical project at the moment. They've got three years, I think, to hopefully deliver the the concept, so it's just in the very early stages. But it's great that you're there at the table, as we said earlier. Fantastic. We must link up with you. Uh, yes, thank you. Lady yeah, over here. Uh, I'm Cheryl Davis. I'm one of the reporting radio officer at uh, West Sussex Hospital Trust. Um, mine kind of encompasses your issue with your band fives as well, because, I mean, um, although I can use a computer, my um, data entry knowledge is pretty much good quality data in is good quality data out. Therefore, if our radiographers are not producing good quality images, 
as the skill set that we've all been trained for, then the AI is not going to be able to utilise anything we put into it. So actually, we're very fundamental to this, and I can't understand why we haven't been invited to the table to ensure that we are conforming to Kitty Clark's standard practice and this is how you're going to do your images, because if you're not doing your images properly and they're not utilising the equipment properly to give you good exposures, good collimation, then everything we provide that computer is really going to so, be rubbish. I mean, it's a really, really good point. And I know that some of the work that's been happening in Cambridge, there has been that dialogue and that interface with the professionals, particularly, I think in one area, it might have been related to breast, can't recall, but they were very keen to engage with the radiographers to ensure that image quality was appropriate, correct, and of the highest standard so that it informs those algorithms and that development. It's a really good point. Yeah. Sorry, yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Harry Smith from King's College Hospital in London. Um, it's a question about AI and about embracing AI. Um, we've got a sexual straight for health who's very publicly pro-IT in healthcare. Um, I'm just wondering, um, as our bodies of the Society College of Radiographers and the Royal College of Radiologists, what, what's their efforts to um, sort of have dialogue with central government about this and, and capitalise on the fact that we do currently have a, a Secretary of State who, for Health who's very pro this? I think that's one, this is one for you, Charlotte. I, I got, I've got so, to be careful what I say. No, 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 you can say free world. Um, the topple review, which was referred to earlier, I think, by Alison, um, we were aware that piece of work was happening, that more detailed review, because there was the interim report published, which I think came sort of a little bit sort of left field. So they then did a, a big call for evidence for this next piece of work. We tried to get to the table, I think, like a, a lot of different professionals, but we submitted quite a lot of evidence on the behalf of memberships, both in, in relation to the implications of technology across all of the pathway, not just artificial intelligence in terms of image reporting, but in terms of every other aspect of patient management, a uh, comprehensive review on diagnostic and therapeutic. So I'm really interested today, I haven't had opportunity to review the report yet, to see what's within that. We've also been trying to encourage Eric Topple to be at our National Radiology Managers Conference, but he's, he's a very highly sought after man, I think, who gave his time, as I understand, free to the NHS, supposedly. So we are really actively trying to engage and find those opportunities, and so it's really great to hear from members here who are at the table. Um, I think a lot of it is very high level at the moment, computational stuff, but we actually need to be there. And some of the work that we've been doing in terms of attending conferences, obviously our president and council have been to the radiological conferences in America, and the European Congress will be there again in, in April forming some connections. So we're actively doing this. I will also, as an action from this uh, meeting, take it to the Clinical Imaging Board, which is where we work really closely with the Royal College of Radiologists and the physicists, who are also a really important partner in this work. So absolutely, I think it's, it's a good point you raise. We continue to lobby. Body? Oh, one more. <laughs> one more to the next one. Um, the bit that bothers me, I think, uh, which is why I wanted Kevin to speak about this um, topic, was <clears throat> we have a very UK-centric thing which is advanced practice, radio for reporting. You go anywhere in the world, you, you will not find what we do. And so you alluded to this at RSNA. So the bit about AI, which I think is key, is we need to be thinking about the things that aren't transferable in other countries, like, for example, the US, uh, or you mentioned Russia. Um, Israel seems to be massively making steps forward to get them thinking about the practice of how we utilise, um, how we work within advanced practice and consultant practice over here, and how that's going to level in with, with AI, because it might be transit, translatable with um, radiologists and clinicians, where you can see a, uh, the same roles being delivered other parts of the country, but particularly here in the UK, this is why I think it's such a key point. We need to get that across 
early that there's different practices, it, it might be the same out, outcome. And, and one final thought, sorry, is this, this thing about data, I, I get it and understand why people are very sensitive about data, particularly when it's, um, you know, it's our health data, but what, what I guess sort of frustrates me is sometimes we press allow all the time with an app that then just reads everything that we, yeah. we do and, and arguably has more information about us. And I think it's the PR around data that we need to be, we, you know, uh, uh, and how we're going to share that data. It's the PR on that that I think is key because otherwise it naturally worries people. It's mm. my last point, sorry. Mm. Question for you now. Who owns the radiology data? Mm. Who? It's the Secretary of State. Mm. He actually controls, you know, he, he has ownership of it. It's, uh, it. it's not the patients, it's the Secretary of State. So if you have a Secretary of State who is keen to forge relationships with startups, or that's what's going to happen. Can I just add a point about the advanced clinical practice movers on a little bit? Because we talk in, in diagnostic radiography particularly about reporting, and we focus solely on reporting, yet we, we know that there are a vast number of other roles that fit and will enable advanced clinical practice and advanced clinical practitioner roles within diagnostic radiography. And I think we need to be careful as a profession not to lose sight of that, We've, because actually the artificial intelligence will help us augment, help us deliver timely results to patients, but we know we're delivering a whole host of other activities across that pathway, caring for that patient in that delivery of that diagnosis. And I think we need to think about that more, role more broadly. Um, I'm yeah. sure you've got a view, Kevin. Well, yeah, I, I have. I mean, it's, and it's something which Alison said earlier. She was talking about, you know, is this just a substitution? And I, I don't think it is a, just a substitution for a cheap alternative to, to medi a medical task. I think the, if you look across the NHS now, all, all of us, physios, radiographers, nurses, we're on this journey where we are, you look, we're looking at the budget and we're, and we're asking the question, how can we deliver a better quality service with the money that's available to us? And it, it isn't about substitution, it's, a, it's because it's been proven that we can spend the money more wisely. So I think that's why we're on this journey, so it's not just about reporting. I'll come back to say again and again, it, it, it is just a tool. And you have people working in the NHS because we have to have a relationship with our patients and we have to serve their needs. Whether you're a doctor, whether you're a radiographer or a physio, they still have to have that dialogue with a clinician. So don't see it as a threat, but get engaged. I just want, I just want to say something. Um, two years ago, um, 18 months ago, I was looking at losing my job, okay? Um, I, I, I was almost, I was expecting that in many ways because um, the job I was doing, um, which I did for eight years, I wasn't even sure it was going to take me to retirement before technology removed me. Okay, we opened a new cancer centre at Guy's and technology removed my job. The machine does, the computers do it now. And now I've got the best job mm -hmm. that I could have ever dreamt of in the world. Mm -hmm. I look after a patient pathway, I care for every, the whole pathway, I'm in charge of the pathway, I decide which patients get treated when and how we do it. Our support, the whole thing, is the most amazing job. I'd never even thought that that was possible. I was looking at retirement, I was looking at a finished career, and now I've got the best job on earth. And you know, we don't know what's around the corner, and we have to make sure we're there and ready to take those opportunities. We all acquire skills and abilities as we go through our careers. We, we underestimate what we're able to do. And as Kevin so rightly said, it's all about patience. At the end of the day, we are still needed to care for our patients. Here, here. Well done. <laughs>
Absolutely. And it's sort of reconfiguring and looking for those opportunities, using your unique skills, but actually applying them in a different way for patient care. And I think the same is true and can be true in diagnostic radiography, particularly as we approach, you know, more timely giving of the diagnosis, uh, management of the pathway, moving patients on and on in their pathway. And we've got examples of that of consultant practitioners working in this country exactly doing that assessing patients giving taking the imaging reviewing moving patients on and, and supporting their care and i think that's where we need to be thinking i've got a question for alison though because we obviously are in really involved in a lot of workforce planning and trying to influence everything with government and policy makers and you you know you rightly talked about your approach to workforce planning how are you influencing government alison because we're still really on the numbers and we still can't even get the numbers registered appropriately with the HCPC between diagnostic and therapeutic. So that's even looking at, you know, the supply side, which we need to move away from. So I'm really interested in hearing about your success, hopefully, in <laughs> influencing patterns. Influencing government. <laughs> <laughs> um, government has its own agenda. That's the thing. And, and I think one of the unfortunate things about the healthcare system, particularly in England, is that it's, you know, it's, it's at the will of government. Uh, it doesn't exist as an entity on its own. So being able to influence and lobby is, is actually really important. And I think your, um, you know, things like submissions to the top was really yeah, yeah, important. Yeah. The biggest thing I think I've seen in, um, and one of the things that I try to do, uh, particularly with policy makers, is there's, there's a guy called Eric Holnager who does a lot of work on safety. He talks about the work as imagined versus the work as done. So we take the time to go and find how the work is done whereas a lot of policy makers will look at the work as imagined. They will think they know what you do mm. and make decisions about how many of you there should be, mm -hmm. what advanced practice looks like, and your future. Um, so it's really bringing it back to the work as done and, and trying to help people at all levels in all organisations, and whether that's the, the, the board, a trust board or its policy makers, it's about helping them understand the work has done and the importance of the work has done as it relates to outcomes. So being clear about what outcomes you achieve is also really important. Um, different professions use different scripts and they have different kinds. It's, it's, so the thing about jurisdiction mm. is, is mm. the important thing. Mm. Um, being able to articulate that. And actually, as a band five, you should be able to articulate that. Why, why is my job important? Because someone will one day ask you, it will come or whether you're um, running an entire service so what I'm hearing now is that end-to-end -end stuff now I'm hearing next time I, anyone asks me about radiography I'm thinking well they see the whole thing that's an important message mm -hmm. I didn't know that before I came here tonight mm -hmm. so it's about being influenced at every level and taking every opportunity to tell people what you do and why it's important thank you can I just say that the band fives, I mean, these are the, the bands who are going to be coming up towards the consultant level, you know, mm. and like I said, I just think it's really, really important that you, you can do all of this, but it's just about getting the paperwork as well, because you are the workforce of the future, and you, you can do all of this. So band fives, fantastic, but you can do more as well, definitely. Be accountable for the level that you were at and want aim to go further as well. You can definitely do that. Any other questions from the floor? Because I have one more question, which is, to help, is an exam question for me, really, to help me with a presentation that I'm going to deliver soon, which is about the future of the profession um, in 40 years. So I perhaps ask each of the panel members to give a sort of short um, viewpoint on, on our profession in 40 years. What do you think it will look like? What do you think we'll be doing? Shall I start with Sheila? Because you looked back about 30-something years, didn't you? 40 I, I years. Did, I did do 40 yeah. years. I, yeah. I can't believe I'm that old. Um, I think things change far faster than they used to. Um, when I think about when I qualified um, and what we do now, um, it, it's awesome. I, I think um, in 40 years' time, I'd like to see... I think we'll be more involved in patient pathways. I think um, there'll be more jobs like mine. Mm -hmm. um, where, where we follow a pathway through, we use our expertise and knowledge from when we've done the frontline stuff um, and we move up 
uh, and we support that patient journey and, and we walk that journey with patients and, and, and we'll be able to call on all aspects of experience. So, um, you know, the therapeutic bay job will be calling on the knowledge that they've acquired through diagnostic imaging and things. The diagnostic radiographer will be, will be using that knowledge to support the patients. You see patients before they're diagnosed. It, wouldn't it be great for you to walk that journey with them and see it to the other end? Whether, whether it's um, cancer, whether it's cardiac, you know, um, we, we, have a, we have wealth of skills and opportunities that we're better than any other professional group at doing. And we need to develop those skills. Great. I like walk that journey. That's good. <laughs> yes, I'd like to agree with Sheila. I think mm. we need to get more involved in the in the patients patients' pathways, um, particularly in diagnostic. We tend to see people once or twice. I work in CT, so quite often we do see people on um, programs of where they're trying out new regimes um, and lots of research pathways. So we do see people perhaps every six weeks, every three months. I don't think, one thing that will never change about our profession is the patients. We're always gonna to have to put them at the center. And our research and our work going forward is to make that journey better for the patients, to find ways of making it easier for people. And speeding up things. I mean, we all know about the two-week wait pathways and all the, the moving the goalposts all the time. What we also need to do is to keep lobbying for better equipment, more students, actually funding our students properly, encouraging people to come into the profession, and once they're in the profession, encouraging them to carry on with research and develop their profession for the good of the patients. Great, thank you. This question gets harder to answer the further it goes to the right, so i um, <laughs> 40 years time, blimey. Um, four, 40. Four, 40. 40, yeah. four, four zero. Yeah, we're a long way off. Well, I don't particularly care then. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but you care for the future of our profession. I, th I think I mean, it's increasingly, it. <laughs> increasingly you'll see a blurring of the boundaries you will have, in fact, you could end up with, I think you'll have national, regional imaging therapeutic services, uh, blurring of boundaries. You will have probably fewer medical imaging specialists. You will have much more uh, of that role be taken on by, by the radiographers. I think you will see our assistant practitioners possibly doing a great deal more, well, they will be doing a great deal more than they're currently doing. And I think that'll do. Thank you. Tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> well, within, with, well, within 40 years, I mean, for me, what I would like to see is more of the radiology, radiography, acceptance. I mean, for me, there's still a lot of um, the radiologists who are more unaccepting of what the radiographer role can do than what I would like. So I'd like to think that within four years, you know, both the modalities are working really, really well together, can enhance each other's skills, accept each other. The assistant practitioners who are a fantastic resource, that they are also doing more as well for the profession, that they are being allowed to do more. So yeah, blurring of the boundaries for radiology and radiography, that's what I would really like to see within 40 years. So more team working, true team working, and perhaps education together. Alison. I think it's, it's difficult to predict the future. We might get an algorithm to do it, I guess, <laughs> at some point in the future. Um, I would say your best bet is to write it yourselves. So you need to write your own future. You guys are in the best position to say what radiography becomes. Um, and as a patient, I'm kind of keen that you do. <laughs> uh, I certainly don't want to start up writing that. Um, so I think own it, write your own script. It will change, you know. The world changes incredibly quickly. I don't know if it's because I'm getting older, <laughs> but the world seems to get change faster and faster. 
um, but you're in charge of your own destiny. So I say, write your own story, write your own future. Great, thank you. Thank you all, that's been great. Foddy, any other, you, you want to come up? Yeah, Absolutely. Just to say a big thank you to our, to our speakers. I think it's been a fantastic evening and it's really been great to look at the future of the profession. Uh, in the past, we've focused on, on reporting in particular. So actually, it's been good to have that broader perspective. Well done. Yeah, very good. Sorry.